Okay, so welcome back to my channel. Um, I'm not the best at intros, so I'm just going to say today we're talking about the prodigal son. And you might have heard that term used before for someone that's like run away in pursuit of money and came home. But originally, prodigal meant squanderer. It meant someone who was wasteful and not someone that like ran away from home and then came back. So let's start with the story. I'm not going to read the story like all the way through. I'm going to break it up into chunks and kind of explain it as we go along. So we're going to start first. The story is found in Luke 15. And we're going to start with verses 11 through 14. So this is Jesus telling a parable. And he's talking to a group of people. But the Pharisees, so like the highest people in society. And also tax collectors who were basically thieves. Were listening to him. Hold on. Okay, so let's start. Oh, first of all, before we start, I think we should talk about what the difference is between a parable and a story. So while a parable is technically a story, the difference between a story and a parable is that a story mentions specific names and parables do not. Parables just give you the details so you can get the main point of the parable. And stories have names like Zacchaeus, or Lazarus, or Adam and Eve, or Esther, those are stories. This, and also the parable of the sower, are stories to prove points. And while, or are parables to prove points, sorry. Stories prove points, but they get a little more specific into the names, which parables don't really need because there's one concise point that the parable is trying to make. Okay, so Luke 15, 11 through 14. So then Jesus said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. So even in my Bible right here, under the word prodigal, it says wasteful. So, a little backstory. In the olden times that we're talking about, when the father passed away, typically the assets were divided between however many sons he had, and the oldest son would get two thirds of what his father owned, the next youngest son would get a third of what was left, the next youngest son would get a third of that, and so on and so forth. And in, but in this case, there were only two sons. So, um, the older son received, or would have received, two thirds of what the father had, and the youngest son would have received one third. And it was basically to help them jumpstart their own life or career, like if they wanted to go into being a farmer or growing crops, whatever the father had was given to them to help them start their own business. So, when the youngest son went to his father and told him he wanted his portion, he was basically telling his father that he wished he would hurry up and die so he could get what was owed to him and then waste it. And he might have not said it directly, but it's insinuated. And his what's cool, I guess you could say, is that his father didn't question why he wanted his portion. He just gave it to him and kind of just let him do whatever he wanted to. So the story of the prodigal son, in short, is a son... It's about a greedy son who took his portion and blew it on prostitutes and gambling and like stuff like that that someone of faith would not do. And then once he realized how bad he had it, he returned home. So I, want, I briefly want to mention free will and why God gave it to us. So he gave us free will because he had already said that he would never force himself on anyone and if he did, he would be going back on his word which would mean he isn't who he says he is. God has also already said that he is incapable of lying, so anything he does that goes against his perfect nature means he's not himself, it means he's not God. And he just can't do that. He cannot be less than who he is. So sometimes God will let us do what we want, however stupid it might be to teach us a lesson and then bring us back to him 
and he'll let us indulge in ourselves to teach us how miserable life would be without him. So now, continuing with the story in verses 15 and 16. So this is still the son. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. So, while I was reading this, I asked myself why the son had to go so far away to waste his money. Like, why couldn't he have just wasted it in the town he lived in? And he went so far away because he wanted to flee from anyone who had the slightest idea of what God's word was that way. When they saw the way he was acting, no one there would be able to hold him accountable to God's word. Uh, but God doesn't miss anything. So even though he might have not known anyone in the town he was in, God still saw him. They still saw how reckless and careless he was being. And the youngest son wanted to live in spiritual darkness and do whatever he wanted instead of staying faithful to God's light. Now, I typically only use verses from the story that we're talking about. But today I also wanted to mention John 3, 20 and 21, which is just a few pages away, actually. John 3, 20 and 21 says, For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. So, people who are living in sin hate, they hate to be told that what they're doing is wrong. They hate to be reminded that they know that what they are doing is wrong or bad or sinful. And when they get caught, they aren't sorry that they got, that they sinned. No, they don't care that they sinned. They're sorry that they got caught and that they couldn't continue doing what they were doing. Now, some people are genuinely sorry when they get caught, and that's different. But people, the people who are just blatantly living in sin and enjoying it, they often don't care that they, they did what they did. They care that they got caught and the behavior had to stop. So... So let's go back. So once the money that the youngest son had was gone, he found himself poor, hungry, and alone. And he was so desperate that he took a job feeding pigs, which is a no-no, a big no-no, to the Jews. So while he was working, he noticed that the pig food was starting to look pretty good. And then he finally came to his, his senses and he said in verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? So he realized that even his father's poorest servants had an abundance of bread and water. And here he was, starving and thirsty. He finally gave in to conviction, the conviction that he felt, and decided to return home. And all the way home, he was planning what to say to his father, which is in verses 18 and 19, and it says, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he, he basically was gonna tell the father, like, look, I'm sorry for what I did. Um, it was nice while it lasted, but I'm back. I'm not even worthy to be called your son anymore. Uh, you can, if you'll take me back, I would not, care at all to be one of your poorest, lowest servants. I just want to be in the same land as you because you're my father. And then in verses 20 through 24, it says, And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and bring 
and put a ring on his hand and sandal on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry so when he got home he didn't even get to finish his little speech he made because his father was so happy to see him that he was like son I don't care shut it I'm just glad you're home I missed you so much I don't care what you say you're forgiven. You're still my son. I still love you. And how did, how would the father have seen him? Let's say he was like two miles down the road. How would the father have seen him coming from such a distance unless he was watching for him? That means he was probably like waiting every day. Not maybe like waiting only for his son to come home, but he was at least watching for him to be coming back down the road. So, and then in the next few verses which is where the older brother comes back it says this is verses 25 through 32 it says now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house he heard music and dancing so he called out one of the servants and asked what these things meant and he said to him your brother has come and because he has received him safe and sound your father has killed the fatted calf but he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. So, I like this story. That made me happy. The father, so the son's basically like, really? Are you kidding me? I've worked for you faithfully and diligently every year of my life since I've been old enough to walk. And you've never even given me your smallest goat that I could kill it and spend quality merry time with my friends but your son over here that wasted everything you worked for you kill your most i want to say sacred but like your fattest calf which probably would have had the best tasting meat because your jerk of a son came home and the dad's like no son you don't get it my son is home and the brother's like yeah i see that and the dad's like no he's home he was lost to the world, but he's back, and I still love him the same I love you. So the dad says, it was right that we should make merry and be glad. The dad is telling his son, like, I understand you're upset because you've worked for me faithfully, and you haven't yet been, been rewarded, but you will eventually, I promise. And the son, he just didn't get it. So in the story, in case you haven't figured it out yet, which it's okay because it took me a little. The, so, the father is representative of God. The youngest son are people who are representative of people who seek the world and its pleasures, but ultimately make their way to God. And the older brother is representative of Christians, or anyone really, who is uh, excuse me, Pri uh, proud, prideful, I almost made up a word there, prideful and selfish of serving God their whole life, yet not being rewarded as fully or celebrated as fully as a sinner, we're all sinners, but of someone who enjoyed living in sin, making their way to God. So, oh, there's two more verses I wanted to read to you really quickly before I move on with my notes, which is Ephesians 2, 1 and one. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. If I could find it, it would be great. Alright, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And it says, And you and you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you were once in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works, 
and the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So that's basically what the dad was telling the oldest son is like, I understand you're frustrated, but my son who was lost to the world is now home with me and that is cause to celebrate regardless of if you're mad or not. Not everything's about you. So in the story, like I said, the father represents God, God the father. The youngest son uh, is those represents those that are lost to the world. And the older son is, you know, okay, I have to, I don't have to explain it again. Hopefully it made sense the first time. All right, so, um, Romans, okay, next we're going to really quickly go to Romans 8, 15, and 15 through 17. I really like this story and I have so many points to make that I'm kind of jumping around. I'm trying not to. But, okay, so, Romans 8. Fifteen through 17 says, For you do not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So that, that ties into the son, the youngest son and the dad celebrating his return. Great. Now we can, I'm done with the Bible for now. So, I want to just really quickly talk about some other stuff that also has to do with this. So, you can kind of tell when someone is that's new to the faith is starting to backslide because they are like they stop coming to church, they stop talking to their Christian friends, they stop reading their Bible, and if that happens to you, please don't get discouraged. God is not going to ignore you or leave you because you sinned. We all still sin. We don't stop sinning because we become Christians we just become painfully aware of the sin and we do our best to avoid it daily so if you stray from God's word the first thing you should do before you go back to church before you start reading your Bible again is turn to God not to yourself and I know you've heard people say well I got myself into this I can get myself out and newsflash no you probably can't so turn to the father and not to yourself repent to god first before you do anything else that has to do with church turn to god and say you know look i'm sorry i know that what i've been doing lately is not what you would have for me and i'm sorry please forgive me and believe that he has forgiven you if you are truly sorry about what you've been doing so we aren't even worthy to be called god's child yet he forgives and accepts us do i yeah i do okay just kidding we're bringing back the bible i didn't see this little verse written down here romans 6 6. if my bible would open would be great romans 6 So Romans 6.6 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he, And this is verse 7. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So, when someone is living in sin, regardless of if they want to admit it or not, they are a slave to sin they are addicted to sin in a sense and usually the word slave or servant has negative connotations but if you're a slave to the word of God 
are a servant of God, you are one of the most free people on planet Earth because you have nothing to worry about. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Like, you don't, like, yeah, you're tempted by the things of the world, but the things of the world don't become your priorities. Your entire priority list changes when you become a child of God. So. The heart of God is waiting with anticipation for you to come to him. God delights. Every person that turns to God is celebrated equally in heaven. The angels rejoice and they sing and they celebrate because another lost soul has found its way to eternity. So that's kind of like what I wrote here when the older son was like, what the heck dad I've worked for you my whole life and yet I don't get celebrated so those who are always with God have access to all of his riches the son who gets lost and finds his way back deserves to be celebrated he was dead and now he's alive again the father wasn't celebrating the sin that the son lived in the father in the story was not celebrating that his son went and wasted everything he had worked for on prostitutes he was celebrating the fact that his son had come to his senses and returned home. So God celebrates when people commit to serving him and make their whole life about serving God and pleasing him. So I said this in my last video, but Jesus didn't save you for you to still be a sinner. I know that's kind of confusing when I just said a few minutes ago, everybody sins, which is true, but Jesus did not die for you to claim to be a Christian and still live in the sin of the world. You need to pick one or the other. There is no half in, half out with Christianity. There's no on the fence with being a child of God. You are either fully committed to serving God or you are a slave to the world, whether you want to admit it or not. So, Jesus saves bad people and transforms them and if you don't believe that God changes lives you are out of touch with the power of Jesus get it through your thick head your into your heart and into your mind that Jesus can and does transform those that commit to him so that is the end of my notes which means technically the video is over um, I hope you guys enjoyed the story if you want to read it for yourself and not hear me rambling in between the scriptures, it's Luke 15 verses 11 to 32. And it's a really good story. I like the underlying message of it that if you, no matter what you've done in your past, if you are willing to come to, to God and commit to him and lay everything you've done down, you are forgiven and you are made new, a new creation of God. So, don't be afraid of God. Like, God is scary. You should be, have a, a healthy fear of God and His authority. But you shouldn't be afraid of God. He's not scary. Like, God's not a monster. He's not scary. God's amazing. He's so, like, He's every, every sustainable thing you've wanted. Like, peace, joy, security, hope. That's what God is. That's what it makes, that's what makes him up. That is his genetic makeup, if you will. He is everything good and pure and holy. And if those are things you want in your life, like a sound mind, you don't want to be anxious all the time, you don't want to be depressed all the time, you don't want to be sad or hating your life. No, I'm not saying that you, you need what well, you do need to, but I'm not going to force you to turn to God because that's a choice you have to make on your own but I would encourage you to explore the Word of God you don't have to tell anybody you don't have to like make it public especially if you're not from a culture that accepts the Christian religion um, it's worth it the the rewards you'll get in heaven are absolutely worth defying your family you guys just see that little feather go like <laughs> okay so that's the end of the video i hope you guys enjoyed the video and the story i hope everything made sense um 
I wish you guys would interact with me like I'm asking you to in the comments and tell me if there's anything I could change because sometimes I feel like I'm just doing this so wrong and when I talk it doesn't make sense. So your guys' input would really be helpful. Constructive criticism, not being a jerk and telling me that I'm awful. So thank you guys. Have a great day. And you see, yesterday I said stay curious. Stay... Stay beautiful.